Okay, welcome everyone. And uh, I'm a, hello and welcome to our case study webinar of Arkiva and their cultural evolution journey. I'm Amanda Fajak. I'm president of Walking the Talk for North America. And uh, for those of you who don't know Walking the Talk, we are a global culture consultancy and our purpose is to turn culture into a catalyst for growth to enable organizations and people to thrive. And joining me here today from Arkiva, we have Shusha Khan, who is the CEO. We have Sarah Jane Crabtree, who is the Chief People Officer and recently joined six months ago. And we have Dominique Biles, who is the Organization Development Director. So thank you all for uh, joining me today. And uh, I particularly want to say thank you, Shuja, as the CEO for joining us, often for case studies. Uh, CEOs often don't have the time, but I think the fact you are here is actually pretty symbolic of uh, the approach to culture transformation at Arkiva. And I think uh, having the audience hear your perspective as the CEO, but also SJ and Dom's view of the role of the CEO in culture transformation, I think will be particularly interesting uh, to the people that are joining us. So let's dive right in. And Shuja, I might start with you because Akiva is a 100-year-old company, uh, but it's probably not as well known as you might expect, and particularly for our overseas um, participants. It would be great for you to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Thank you, Amanda. Hi. Hi, Amanda. Hi, everybody else. Uh, and thank you for having us uh, uh, for this particular webinar. Um, you're right, it's, it is an old company. Uh, it's been uh, been around for, for quite a long time. Actually, there's some really interesting things that we're doing for the future, but we'll come to that later, I suspect, in the discussion. Um, we're a British business, uh, and we are essentially provide the backbone for broadcast TV and radio across the whole of the UK. Uh, and we have a lot of infrastructure, and we provide services for channels like the BBC. Many people would have heard of that. Uh, and we cover every single corner of the UK. So we will be delivering TV to four out of five households in the UK, uh, and we deliver all the radio, whether it be in the car or in the home. And we use the same technology to provide services to the utility sector. So by that, I mean the gas, electricity, uh, and water companies, where we provide the backbone for connecting smart meters into people's homes. Uh, and we've currently got 4 million households, and that home uh, opportunity is gonna be quite substantial. Uh, and just to give it a bit more context, we have some international uh, business as well. So we deliver TV to uh, uh, over 100 countries uh, uh, for the likes of people like Al Jazeera uh, using satellite technology primarily, but increasingly we're using uh, internet-based technologies as well. Uh, we've got about 1,230 employees uh, uh, and it's a, what I would say is a distributed workforce uh, and quite a lot of engineering fraternity within that workforce, relatively long tenure, I'd say something like 10 plus years. Um, as you can kind of imagine that, that they've been around the business uh, quite a long time. So that sort of gives you a little bit of a, a dynamic of, of, of the business that, that we that we manage uh, over here at Arkiva. Fantastic. And I think some of those dynamics about the length of tenure and that play a really important part in the culture journey as well. Um, so thank you for those who have joined while Shuja was introducing Arkiva. I just want to let you know there is a Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Please submit questions as you're going along and we'll look to answer those as we go through and we'll have a dedicated Q&A section at the end as well. So Shuja, let's talk a little bit about the journey, which started really in around April, May 2021. And you know, people always, what is it that was a catalyst for you as an executive that you really needed to think about culture? Yeah, great question. Uh, I joined the business in January of 2020, um, and it was just before COVID happened, actually, and that was an interesting period for us as well, because everything went into lockdown, and we still had to provide services that became even more important. So quite an interesting time to join the business. But if I, well, if, and that was a sort of operational challenge that we faced, but the strategic challenge that we faced was the business historically was all about maintaining services and delivering on the services that we had today to the existing customers. But some of the seg segments in which we operate, there was a structural challenge in terms of decline. So some people are watching less linear TV, for example, some of the old radio technologies are gonna become at some point uh, less relevant, relevant. And so we as a, an executive team had to think about what that future looked like. And so we had to go from a situation where it's a case of maintaining to grow. Um, and we had to make some very, very difficult choices uh, because you can't just do it tra transferring. Some of the things that we are facing were quite seismic and we could see that that impact could happen within the next two or three years. Uh, so we, we had to restructure the business. Uh, we reorganized it uh, from a business unit perspective to a functional model. 
and that put a lot of people at risk. And so we had to go through a big restructuring program as far as that's concerned. We had to establish a new strategy and start, start to inculcate what we were trying to do as a business. And in some cases, people knew that the change was needed. In other cases, people said, well, actually, we've been doing okay for the last 10, 20, 30, 100 years. Why do we need to make those changes? And so some, some of those things came through while we we're doing that. And we had to do all of that, as I mentioned, during a period where everyone was locked down. So people were working remotely. And so you can see level of anxiety is up, as well as making this type of change, which a business that, like Arkiva probably hadn't faced in, in its sort of recent corporate memory. Uh, so quite a lot happening in a very short space of time. So that was quite quite an important thing for us to sort of consider. I mean, I think the kind of cultural shift, um, you know, you can make the, you can sort of move the bones around and we put the structure together. And, and, and that was, I think, really important as a foundational thing. But we needed the muscle to start working again and mm -hmm. making sure that the new way that we structured the business was operationally effective. And that's where the sort of cultural questions came to the fore. And, you know, that for me is the muscle that makes the business and the body of, of the organization work. And we saw that actually there was no, some, some cases there was no muscle tissue at all. In other cases, it was working in the wrong directions. And so we need to move things in a different direction. I sort of been to my chiropractor for time to time. And, you know, when you haven't used a particular muscle for a long time, it's been quite painful uh, and, and, and quite tight and taut. Uh, and so we had to go through that. And that takes longer. And that's why we asked you, you and your company to come and help us uh, to get on that journey. And, and that's where that, that sort of conversation started. Great. And so how did you land on what the culture needed to be? Like, so for you, what was kind of really critical in that decision and what was what was important in, in defining that? So up front, I talked about the long tenure. So many people had been around the business a long time. In fact, the, there was an executive team there before many of them left. I came on board. There's a few other people. So we were a relatively new executive team. Mm -hmm. um, and by the very nature of people who are attracted to this particular opportunity at Arkiva because of the change and the transformation that I talked about, you had a lot of people who were change agents at the executive level. Mm -hmm. But I can imagine the sort of cohort of people who are within the business who really needed to deliver had been around there for quite a long time and probably didn't have the same change propensity as, as the executive team. And so quite quickly we thought, actually, if we drive this really quickly in terms of change, 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 and the organization says, no, I keep using the sort of body and muscle analogy, you get a tissue rejection. Mm -hmm. uh, and that could be quite a big feature. And in a way, we thought, actually, we're probably not the best people. So we had some hypotheses into what needed to happen. And I talked about the growth mindset, the drive for curiosity, being focused on where the market was moving and be able to transition the business to, alongside where the customers were going, all those type of dynamics. We thought we needed some more help to understand and diagnose the problem and then come up with a set of solutions that were in the right space to get us to where we need to get to and make sure that that gap between the the, the propensity for change amongst the executive team and the ability to deliver that change, which is the organization was sort of, uh, that gap was closed and that we could kind of really drive that forward. So that's really how I sort of thought about it. Um, and I think that was helpful because I think you have to have an element of humility. If you think you have all the answers, you're probably gonna end up falling over before you even start the race. And so that's that was quite helpful. And I think having an outside in perspective really helped us because you've got to speak with truth to, to the executive team who are trying to do what, what we were trying to do at that time. Yeah, and I think, you know, my observation of, of the team through that process was this ability to really think strategically and you had such a big vision, which was, you know, at that time it felt like a very big stretch for the best, rest of the organisation. We'll talk about actually it doesn't seem so far now, but actually this ability to kind of for you to really listen to, to what that, that stretch was causing people and, and how there were some pain points that, that were emerging from that, that change you were trying to drive. I think that, you know, a number of people on the call may have similar organizations or challenges where they've had a lot of stability or they've had a quite a, a long tenured workforce and they're trying to kind of jolt it to move. Are there any particular tips around from your experience at that early stage around getting people to kind of engage that things needed to be different? Yeah, I mean, look, some of it's about telling stories and making sure that you had stories to tell about, you know, where that change is going to be for the benefit of everybody. I mean, ultimately, particularly if you do a substantial restructure, I mean, just to give you an order of magnitude, you know, the 1400 odd people that we had at the time, we put 900 at risk. Mm -hmm. So there's trauma that goes with it. And I think that requires to it requires us to engage with and co converse with people and understand why we're making the changes that we're making, because they have direct impact on, on their day to day lives. Uh, and I think it's important to make sure that you reach out to everybody and have conversations in language that they understand. I think in fairness, you know, people like myself, you know, we've worked in the corporate environment quite a bit. 
and we uh, and I'm quite a sort of think about strategy and the language that we use can just come across as corporate jargon and making sure that you translate that particularly given the sort of field force that I'd referred to the remote uh, uh, location some of the, the people are at, you really got to reach out to them and make sure that you've got good communication channels and and have a, a bigger dialogue I think the the thing that we learned from this is that it you know we made some mistakes and some of those mistakes were we were probably a little bit too top down um, and we didn't engage with people and listen enough and I think if you if I talk about we had on the first phase where we did the change and the second phase is now much more about hearts and minds yeah. it's much about listening we've put a lot of working groups together and got engaged with them we the only people we really sp spoke to when we were making the change was the employee board which represents the employees but most of it was very as you can imagine very kind of what Maslow's hierarchy the hygiene factors right so people will focus on that rather than how do we change this organization together what's the stake that you have and so uh, some of the tools that we've used subsequently sometimes it's just get people in a room which we can do now but we couldn't do during COVID some of the tools that we've worked with together with you on was like the remesh where you have a big conversation and you get people to essentially vote on the things that that mean, that mean something to them and, and actually that helps drive uh, engagement and then we then play back and that is the other thing the playback's really important the yeah. worst thing that you can have is you say i'm going to take some information from from the organization i've done the canvassing i've done this employee survey and then it goes quiet yeah absolutely and, and they're I like and, and they take and people take it back they're like well, what have you done with it why did i make the effort if you're not going to come back and even if you come back and say we've heard you these are the categories and then you sort of help them systematically through it so i think we're in that kind of learning process to to, to around around that engagement piece um, Great, and we'll talk about some, and we'll talk about some of those strengths later about listening and around just really being able to kind of be transparent and the power of that in terms of your change. Dom, I might go to you now um, to talk a little bit about the what. Um, so, uh, the patterns of behaviour. You identified sort of three culture goals that you um, felt were really important in Arkiva. Do you want to just tell us uh, a little bit about those and why specifically they were important? Sure, thanks, Amanda. The, um, well, she just talked about that sort of setting of a long-term strategy and, um, and in sort of analysing the future state that was, was required. And we ran a culture diagnostic at the launch of that strategy just to understand well, what's our current state. And then we can just compare the two. And clearly there was a, a bit of a gap. So Arkiva is a company with many strengths, which we sort of needed to recognize and cherish and nurture but there were certain and she just used a great analogy about the muscle there were certain muscles that were underdeveloped or just not there at all and these three culture goals of accountability one are even curiosity they were the bridge so they were the, the the behaviors that actually we could amplify if we could recognize if we could raise the capability then actually we could deliver um, our strategy because you know, culture strategy two sides of the same coin so specifically those, those sort of patterns of behavior then so you know, curiosity that was all um, orientated around growth so you know to grow clearly you need a growth mindset but for us I think it's more than that because um, you know, our growth picture is not kind of completely mapped out in a sort of linear fashion so to some extent we don't quite know exactly where we need to go um, you know we have some great capabilities of business that can be used to solve you know, a range of um, customer problems but you know we have to sort of harness the whole organization to be curious about that and to really look externally and to um, just explore basically so that that curiosity culture goal is all about growth the accountability one is all about pace and performance so you know we do need to um, go quicker and go faster and specifically make decisions quicker and and actually we've got a session tomorrow the whole exec and leadership team uh, on enabling better quicker decision making and that's part of our kind of package of cultural interventions is that actually we just need to you know, revisit that with the leadership team and just understand the case of what's getting in the way and and the one archiva piece you just talked about the restructure that we did so you're moving from a business unit structure to a, a functional model um, that requires a sense of you know one archiva working cross organization working the like of which we haven't done before so um, that was where we really needed to uh, encourage those sort of uh, cross-functional working collaboration behaviors that we didn't have previously 
Yeah, that's great. And, you know, you're a 100-year-old company, um, as Shisha was describing before, and, you know, you have made some really significant shifts against those three particular culture goals. What do you think has made the partic- the biggest difference in, in your view? So I think if, if I go first and then Shuja can uh, add, I think, well, firstly, our Exco has spent a phenomenal amount of time on this topic. So they've been incredibly thoughtful, intentional, and it, and it starts at the top. So you, I, I cannot overestimate the amount of, executive time that's required if you're going to do this properly then it needs to start there we've also over indexed on leadership development so actually understanding the shadow senior leaders cast um, is, is really 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 critical and then i think some of the other shifts you know kind of you know, maybe talk about numbers and measures in a moment but i think um often it's the little things so the, the little shifts around um uh, you know, Shuja kind of has, has started this sort of audio podcast on a Monday morning called Start the Week. And it's just a, it's a five minute audio cast. And um, I'm hoping you don't mind me saying it, it's imperfect in its kind of creation. It's one take. There's kind of, I'm sure it's kind of um, mindfully imperfect, but it, it's kind of one take. You know, there's sort of, it, it's just him. It's authentic. He talks about what's going on this week, customer visits, customer wins, when he's been out with the field teams. Um, and it just kind of speaks to the whole organization. And actually in our most recent employee engagement survey, you know, lots of people saying, actually, that's the one thing. I feel connected, I feel informed, I feel optimistic because of that one five minute intervention. And mm. then I think you've got some symbolic things around um, you know, the CEO and the ex-co attending every uh, induction session for new starters saying, actually, this is important enough. We're putting our arms around new starters. We're going to take the time to talk to you about culture and about our future and, and the fact that we want you to um, you know, do things differently and help challenge the status quo and kind of just kind of set people off on the right foot. And then there's things like, um, you know, again, leading from the top, Shuja, um, you know, walking out of a meeting. And that sounds very dramatic, but what, what I mean by that is that actually, well, folks, you know, it's down to you and you to make the decision here. You don't need the CEO in the room. Um, I can't contribute to this meeting. And so actually it sort of, it really speaks to, it role models this behavior where we're trying to get everybody to think about um, you know, where they're spending their time, how they prioritize. And you don't always need the most senior person in the room in order to, to facilitate that. So I think there's, there's a number of things like that where actually we can point to some of the, the smaller things that have had a disproportionate impact. And it's, And on reflection, when we started this culture journey, we identified a number of things that we thought, ah, that's going to be a quick win. So we kind of labeled it quick wins. But actually, they weren't quick at all. And actually, they (laughs) took some time. We were quite puzzled, actually, in terms of why isn't this quick? Why isn't this moving faster? And actually, on reflection, it's because they were the right things. And so actually, we'd identified the right things. So therefore, yes, it took a bit of time to unlock. But... Mm -hmm. In unlocking it, we also were able to be curious about, well, why did that take longer than we thought? What was going on? Where, where did it get stuck? So for me, I think the two highlights are, um, you know, don't underestimate the senior leader involvement, specifically your ex-co, but also you know, it doesn't have to all have to be grand gestures. The little things make the difference. Mm. Shusha, can I ask you a question, just a, a follow-up question to that? Because You know, one of the um, challenges uh, that are often faced going through culture transformation is getting enough time of the exco or getting the exco to put enough time towards culture. What is it in your own kind of mindset and your way of thinking about the culture effort that um, has meant you've dedicated the time, the energy and the effort to this? Well, I, I firmly believe in it. I mean, look, I'm, I might be the chief executive and people think you have a lot of power as chief executive. I think the truth of the matter is I don't have a lot, any power at all. Actually, ultimately, I have to motivate other people to do well. Uh, and oftentimes, 99.9% of that is stuff that I'm not, they're doing things that I don't have oversight or, or understanding of. So that's where the culture, it's almost the things that people do when you're not watching that matters. And frankly, that's that's the reality of it. So I think, you know, my instinct was I've got to get this right and we've got to get sorted out. And I think you know, by acting in the way that, you know, some of the things that Dom talked about, you almost project that, and then other people feel the same. So one of the things that, you know, the organization had was it was quite hierarchical. So for me, it was breaking down the hierarchies with some of the things that we've just talked about. And 
I have visited, and I will by the by the next couple, year or so, I would have visited all the sites around the whole of the UK. And there's some places I went to that the chief executive in previous years had never been to in the history of this company, that long history you've talked about. So to do those things, just make sure you're out there and so people can see that visibility is really important. I do this thing at, you know, there's a kind of humility that's important. So, and sometimes we make mistakes. And previously, people think that the, the suits always hide those mistakes. And we were very open. We, we had a technology program that didn't quite hit to that. So put a hand up and said, look, we made a mistake. This is what it looks like. We want to listen from you. How do you help that? So just by doing that, I think everybody then starts saying, actually, it's OK. And you see the positive results that come off that. And that's the key thing. When you start seeing trajectory and traction mm -hmm. and positive outcomes, and I'm sure we'll talk on some of the metrics, people are like, oh, OK, that does work. Previously, people were too scared to talk about those things. And then they're, they're much more open about it. So I think those are all sort of factors for me that 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 makes a difference. You can put everything you want on PowerPoint and you can put, you know, stuff on the internet and everything else, but ultimately people watch what you're doing and then they, they follow mm -hmm. that lead. It's a bit like having mm -hmm. teenagers for kids. You know, when they're young, you can tell them and they listen. When they get to teenage, they don't care what you say. <laughs> it's what you do that makes a difference. If anyone who's got teenage kids well, can probably relate to that. I can totally relate, Shuja. And, <laughs> um, and, and so the, the other thing I would just also observe is, you know, we talk a lot about symbols and use of time. So it's not about necessarily doing additional things, but being very thoughtful about, you know, your use of the finite resources. And, and my observation is that you are very conscious and very thoughtful about how you show up, how you use your time um, as well. And I think that, that, you know, so it's not about you adding a whole lot of things into your agenda, but being much more thoughtful about how you do use the time you have. Yeah, I mean, like I'm, I'm pretty open about one of the things I do is I make sure my diary is half empty two weeks in. Mm, Which, okay. you know, and, and, and in a world where everyone's trying to fill their diaries to demonstrate that they're being productive, I'm sort of going the other way. So well, actually, I don't. I empty my diary out uh, and I, I take meetings out all the time. And I'm sorry if people are offended, but that's just the reality mm. of it. And so where do I focus my attention? One to ones with my direct reports. I have one every week for half an hour to make sure I sort of touch point with them. We cut the executive team meeting in half because I was like, this is not a great use of time. We're not productive. Even that executive meeting is sort of split in a way that we have this, these sessions that are head up, but we're thinking and head down when we're doing. So we're really clear about what mindset we need to be using. So it's all those little things that kind of everyone is projected, that projects through the, the various people across the organization. So we did this thing called a big meeting experiment. And the great thing about things like Teams, which is the software that we use, you're able to understand how people are using their time. So we're able to break it down and actually we cut the number of meetings by half by the, that were initiated by the executive team who are the biggest driver of meetings. So those kind of symbols and actions and transparency, I think make a huge amount of difference in a relatively small amount of time. Yeah, fantastic. And Esther, I just want to ask you, because you, you joined six months ago, so you walked in, and did you notice anything particularly different from perhaps other experiences you've had on executive teams and what you've observed? Uh, yes. So, um, hi, guys. Um, so, uh, yes, I suppose the biggest uh, thing that I observed is the fact that we were so overt about culture and that culture was absolutely a pillar of the strategy and it was something we were going after. And I think the the clarity that we had around what culture meant, because lots of organizations talk about culture and everyone says, oh yeah, it's all about the culture, it's all about the people. I think um, one thing that impressed me about the executive, executive team and the work that had already been done was that actually we'd really defined it. We had a way of talking to our people about it so that we knew what we were trying to do. It was really about saying, we want to work differently. We want to see different behaviors. We want to have different outcomes, but actually you as individuals are really important to us. And so I do think that that was symbolically um, quite different. Uh, it wasn't just a, it's an engagement tool or it's a, you know, it's part of the strategy and it's part of a combination of things. I think we generally saw that it was a strategic choice, but actually was the backbone of how Archiva was going to grow. And I think that was really important. Brilliant, thank you. And so, Dom, let's let's come back to you then. Uh, really about measurement and impact. So, you know, SJ's just you know raised again this link between the culture and the strategy. You know, it was important behaviorally, but it's important business wise. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about impacts you're seeing, how you've been measuring culture over time? Sure. So, there's a couple of kind of, sort of classic ways that we we measure in terms of. Um, through uh, our employee engagement survey, which we use Glint for, so that's the platform that we use. Um, and actually since September, 2021, we've seen some 
you know, seriously impressive increases, you know, engagement up 13%. And then you know, across the various kind of um, themes, culture, they're all double digit increases, culture up 12, confidence and leadership up 17, excitement about the future up 13. So we're seeing a, you know, we're seeing a significant increase across all those kind of measures, um, which kind of correlates to how it feels across the organization. So the two things kind of work hand in hand. Um, we also, um, you know, in partnership with, with Walk in the Talk, um, kind of engage in various diagnostics along the way. So in October of last year, we um, ran a, a culture diagnostic, um, and that was at, at about the 18 month point of, our, of this journey. And we'd always said this is a four or five year endeavor. So that's probably important to note is that actually done properly and, and done in a sustainable way, any culture journey is, is a multi-year endeavor. So we did a culture diagnostic in October of last year and you know, we had 72% of people saying actually the culture is better than it was 12 months ago. Um, and that gives a whole range of other insights to sort of draw on. I think the other thing here in terms of when you think about measurement, I certainly think the, the goalposts continue to shift because actually the more you learn, the, the, the more the external market changes, the more new people join the organization. It's, it's just, it's, a, it's always a movable feast. So we don't get kind of fixed on kind of um, one set of measures. And then actually, to be honest, when we think about uh, analyzing some of the, sort of the, the business outcomes, initially we fell into the trap of um, overcomplicating. And that's an archivism in terms of we overcomplicate over lots of things. So we sort of designed this kind of almighty kind of metrics tracker and it would have taken probably six months to get the information and keep, keep it running. So we kind of, as it's a job that we're doing right now is kind of scaling that right back and saying, okay, so what are the one or two things that make the difference? So actually under curiosity, you know, what's the one customer measure that makes the difference? Under accountability, um, what's the one productivity measure? Just so actually we can really line up um, you know, our culture work and the impact it has on the business. And this is a changing business as well. So actually in, in, some, in some instances, the, the measures that we have are in their infancy. So, um, so we want this to be not kind of measurement for measurement's sake. We really want to land the, the, right, uh, the, the right tracking. So, so it's something that's really important to us, um, but it's kind of, you know, some of it's work in progress. Mm -hmm. And Shuja, holy grail, is there a financial benefit of the work on culture? Is there anything that you feel you can put your finger on even intuitively or, or kind of numerically? Look, if we don't change the culture, we can have the best strategy in the world. I don't think this business is going to grow with the set of ambitions that we've talked about. Now, do I have the, the empirical uh, outcome of that? Not really. But I think, you know, I can see the green shoots. I can see ideas coming in. I think you know we're, we're actually seeing some recent successes. You know, it could just be market changing, it could be what we're doing internally, but it's probably an alchemy of those two things. So, um, but I, 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 you know, unless you know, unless we change the culture, there's only so much you can do in terms of bringing in new talent, right? You've got to make sure that that talent works in combination with the stuff that made us successful so far, and that's why the history is important. History is not important just because we can set, uh, we can uh, rest on our laurels. You know, that's created a, something that was successful and we need to make sure that we continue that down that path but actually then the cultural elements will then drive that extra bit of growth that we're looking for and that creativity and curiosity and and, and don was right you know you have a strategy but you don't know exactly how you're going to deliver it uh, you don't know if the market changes what's going to happen we've had a number of shocks in the last number of years certainly in the uk we've had you know, brexit then we had covid and we've got a recession with energy prices and a war on, on our doorstep so those things will happen and the market will change and we just need the culture that's gonna be help, help us adapt through that. Um, but I'm confident that it will demonstrate value uh, well, you know, over the course of the next few years. Brilliant, thank and, you. And I'm on that. And I'm on yeah. that. Say, it's just a small kind of theme, but um, you know, Shuja mentioned our um, you know, uh, meeting culture and mm. often it's a sign of poor accountability, isn't it? You get lots of meetings and yeah. recurring meetings and, and we have seen some shifts on that. So actually the beauty of having the sort of the all the integrated IT is that um, you know, we could work out actually we were spending about a million pounds worth of colleague time in meetings alone every week and you know, a certain a high proportion of that were recurring meetings a yeah. high that were large-scale meetings with not, I think 
nine was the average participant number, which is crazy. And mm -hmm. so having seen a shift in that significantly over the last sort of three to six months, actually that's delivering financial benefit alone and freeing up the organization just to have a bit more capacity to say, okay, well, let's work on the things that actually make the difference rather than compensation for poor meeting discipline. And I think that's a really good example of there are lots of, you know, really paying attention to the little changes that actually can have a big amplified impact inside the organisation. Brilliant. Now, just a reminder to everybody, uh, there is a Q&A function. If you've got any questions for Shuja, SJ or Dom, or just generally, please um, post them in the Q&A and we'll get to those uh, at the end. So, SJ, I'm, I'm curious to come to you because, you know, you've, you're in a, a wonderful advantage. You've come in new, so you can kind of look at things with a fresh eye. You're a deeply experienced C, CPO from, from other organisations. I would love to kind of get a sense of what's resonated with you, what have you observed coming in, um, just what's been your experience? Oh, uh, well, there's lots, um, uh, Amanda, um, that, that uh, I have really liked in terms of um, good practice, if I can call it that, because we, we've been really clear on setting out, um, uh, as Suja sort of alluded to, the sort of like the moments that matter, the, the, the key moments that change uh, culture and they can be anything from as small as just the way that we're communicating with our employees through a you know something like this a webinar it could be something as small as actually Suja goes and sits in a different part of our um, one of our office blocks because he's sat next to somebody and he's talking could not it could be Suja it could be someone else it could you know it could be mm -hmm. me it's just like that people go through so there's a variety of like really simple acts which are like to your point, which are symbols and habits of, of what of what happens. Um, I think um, one of the things that really resonates is, is that we is we really are building up that authenticity. So again, mm -hmm. you know, when Sue just said about this hierarchy, um, that was fascinating when I first came in because it really did feel like that. It felt like the exec co were not um, didn't walk on water, but they were the parents of the company. And actually, if the exec co said, uh, then everybody sort of followed because they wanted to be good children or siblings or whatever. You. And actually, I genuinely believe, and I, I literally have only been here six months, mm -hmm. I feel like that has changed. I feel like there is much more of a um, two-way dialogue now where people mm -hmm. feel that they can speak up. Now, it's something we're still working through because obviously some people feel you know, it's career limiting to, to tell the CPO or the, C, the CEO what's going on in the reality. But we are making, um, uh, we're making the opportunity for them to do it. Mm. And again, it mm. goes to those examples I said, right? So again, I'm telling you sort of little habits that we're doing. It's making ourselves available. And then when we do talk to people, it's talking in their language. It's using their experiences and it's being very, um, it, it's a term I use a lot, but employee-led. So mm -hmm. rather than it being a top down approach, like we think we obviously know, you know, what it's like to be an engineer in a field. We don't. So for us to go and sit in a car and go, come on, tell us what it's really like and really understanding that employee led experience is really important. So I think we're creating a lot of opportunities that um, allow us to really understand what either needs to continue because we think it's great practice and it's really good to stop because we think it's completely inefficient and it's just causing pain um, or to tweak if we need to. And I think that authenticity, that listening to people, um, that's, that's, that's coming through really loud and clear. And I think that's a consistent part of our cultural journey and, and, and something that really resonates with me in terms of coming in and, and what we want to do more of. Um, and, that's, and that's a muscle that we're definitely uh, practicing. And what I love listening to all three of you is just the really tangible, practical examples. You know, you're obviously very thoughtful about what are we doing, how are we engaging, and that that kind of consciousness is, is I think, incredibly powerful um, in terms of creating the changes that you've created. So, Dom, um, I want to come back to you in terms of, you know, things that you think have gone really well um, and some of the hurdles you've overcome. We've also just got a question that's come in um, from somebody in the audience who's really interested to hear about how you created more curiosity within the business and how you kept teams engaged. So maybe you could um, pick that up when you talk, talk about what's gone well and, and some of the hurdles you've overcome. Sure. Um, so I think the, um, and I'm reflecting on the, this journey that we've been on with Arkiva to some of the other organisations I've worked in. And 
what stands out here is that we've been really focused and intentional. So we didn't go down the mouse mats and the stress balls and the t-shirts kind of route. We've been very focused on a few things, being very selective, very practical, thinking about behavior, symbol systems, using, using that kind of um, that lens. So three things that I think have gone particularly well. Firstly, I'd say our response to uh, hybrid and remote working. So uh, what we call work life smarter. Um, and I think that's something that all, all companies have had to sort of lean into post pandemic or during the pandemic. But I think the way that we've approached it is that we've adopted a, a principles based approach. We've been very clear at that we don't have all the answers. This is an evolving picture. Um, we've worked with people to sort of to, to, to map that out and really got people to think about the work that needs to be done, the environment that needs to be done in, and the types of customers that you kind of work with and serve. And so, and to get people to think beyond just home or office and think about, well, you know, what are the needs of your team and, and how do you come together uh, as a team and what's that look like? Um, and how do you communicate with each other? So it's more, because we do, like Shu just said, we have a very diverse workforce. Some with a heavy engineering focus that have less choice, maybe about their sort of work location. But within that approach, I think there are lots of choices to be made. So, but I think that the basing that on principles and not mandating rules, I think is really important and set the tone uh, culturally. I think also what's gone well is a, a sense of collective responsibility. Now, in the early days, you know, people would ask me and stop me in the car and say, oh, Dom, how is your culture program going? Because it was, it was my culture program, right? It's like, well, no, no, it's not mine, it's ours. And now I'm hearing much more about people sort of saying, oh, let me tell you about you know, what I've heard and what I've done and what I'm experimenting with. Uh, so there's less of a sense of it's owned by one person or it's owned by the ex-co. It's actually, it's a, it's a group endeavor. And I think thirdly, I think, it's always gratifying when you're sort of, you know, we're sort of 18, 24 months into this journey, whereby you see some things pop up, which is quite, I didn't, I didn't know much about that. So um, our data and insights team led a hackathon recently, and that was, it was, it was a perfect cultural intervention because actually it was bringing people together, high collaboration across functions, focus on a business problem, you know, through the lens of our culture goals, but we didn't prompt them to do that. They were that the, the seeds of that were sown somewhere else, and then it comes to fruition. And the same thing happened with our you know, recently run our round of graduate assessment centers for our graduate intake. And our director of information security came to me and said afterwards that this feels like a different company now. It feels like a different company. They're employing everyone's employing above the line thinking, thinking differently about how we attract people. And actually, that's the feedback we're also getting from prospective candidates as well, in terms of this is what differentiates our Kiva to the other companies they're going to see on their kind of their graduate round is that the culture stands out as being different. So I think just, just to cover off the hurdles, I think the, um, the hurdles that we had to sort of face into and still do is around making this meaningful and accessible for everybody. So there is always the temptation that we kind of lose sight of the fact that actually we, the bulk of our um, you know, sort of, uh, staff are, have a technical orientation or an engineering orientation or they're, they're out um, serving customers. So we just need to make sure that we continue to speak in the right language and mm -hmm. tell stories that, uh, that resonate with them rather than have this sense of we're two companies operating under the same umbrella. And also because people are fiercely loyal here and they, they, they love working for this organization and they're supremely proud of the past, in, in sort of looking to change culture, you've got to be really careful that you don't denigrate the past, that you sort of respectfully you know, identify what's gone well and, and don't inadvertently create a sense of threat in terms of what you're trying to create. So it's about creating harmony between those two things. Can you just remind me about the question, Amanda? So it was around uh, things that you've done to unlock curiosity. So I think there's, again, there's a combination. Actually, I've got to, Dom, you go ahead and I've got something to say on this one. So yeah, I'd like to sort of add to whatever Dom said, so I thought, because I'm... Well, okay, I was, what I was going to say, Shuja, was there's, again, it's a combination of little things and, uh, and big programmatic things. So I think unlocking curiosity just comes with, um, like in the, the, the start of the week pod, uh, podcast, audio cast that Shuja does in terms of um, role modelling 
um, you know, customer experiences and customer conversations and um, just kind of every opportunity telling the stories around how we are gauging with the external environment, the external market. Um, but also I think um, giving people the opportunity through either through learning interventions or through you know, other cultural opportunities to explore what it's like. So giving people almost the time and the space, it's actually it's okay to, um, to have a look outside of your kind of outside of your day job. Go on, Shudu, mm. what you were saying. Well, actually, with Dom, I was reflecting on the conversation we had at the beginning of the week because we, we did a review around our sort of different goals and curiosity one was that I was saying that's one I'm most concerned about because we can't grow without curiosity because everything else will make us operationally more effective. But what we really need to is grow. And I was thinking, well, and the debate we had and the thing I sort of put forward is, is curiosity innate or can it be taught? And I think that's kind of the crux of the question uh, that, uh, the, the, that was sort of set out and uh, by Melanie. And I think where I, where I would, what the tip I would give is, if you have one curious, if you create a community of people and you say, look, come up with some sort of ideas of curiosity. If you had one curious pe person and nine not very curious people in, in a room, guess what's gonna happen? The curiosity is gonna get quashed. Mm -hmm. So my tip here is actually try to go and find the curious people in the organization cross-functioning, put them together. And we have this thing called culture community. And I found one of the sessions I did earlier today, Amanda, was with, these, with, with, with this group of people. And they're people who are innately curious. And so you put them together and then you get this multiplier effect. And then what you need to do is kind of reward them. So they come up with ideas and you say, right, we're gonna back a couple of these ideas. I'm gonna do them. And then you demonstrate to the rest of the organization that's possible. Because if, and then you create this sort of curious community, which then after a while you start getting a bit of a shift in terms of behavior. And the last thing is that recognition is really important. So we get the leadership team together and we've got one on Thursday, as Dom said. And what we'll do is, and what we've done previously is we've said to their peers, tell us about who's done really well under each of these goals. And we recognize them with citations that, that are so demonstrated by them because their peers have recognized that they're doing accountability, one IQ and curiosity. And I can tell you, we had tears for the people who are mm -hmm. recipients because to be recognized by your own, uh, uh, your own peers is really, really quite powerful. And that, I think those are kind of some of the tips I would recommend around curiosity, but it's a tricky one. It's, you know, that's, is it innate or can we kind of teach it? Yeah. Uh, and, and I would recommend you try to get the curious people together and get that, get a bit of a groundswell there before you start putting it back into the organization. Absolutely. Great. So I'm conscious we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I wouldn't mind quickly, SJ, maybe just a minute on what next uh, with our Kiva and then Shuja, maybe just a, a close out from you on any of your key learnings uh, from culture. So SJ, if I can just go to you first, one or two kind of critical things in terms of what's next. Yeah, so, um, so well, actually some of the critical things that, that are next are actually to keep doing what we're doing. So for me, culture is about consistency. And uh, I think sometimes people think they finished when they've got the quick wins. So, well, not even quick wins, because as Dom told us, they're not quick. But where you get those measures, where you think, actually, my engagement's gone up by 13%. Wow, haven't we done really well? No, that's not culture, because culture has to be sustainable, and it has to be the what's talked about at the coffee shop. So we have to continue to look at what do we do really well, what's stuck, and what's genuinely changing behaviour, and ways of working so we use our insights to tell us that and we also reinforce and role model so that is continuous um, we also want to really focus on our storytelling because the other thing about that is although there are pockets of the organization as Suda alludes to who are absolutely curious they're champions and they lead by example there are lots of naysayers still that are probably going oh yes it's only going to last for another six months and then they'll change the world again so we need to be able to have proof points and we need to be able to do a lot about storytelling, but tangible storytelling, what's gone from A to B rather than actually, you know, we are doing lots of good stuff as an aren't we great pat on the back. It's actually what is the significant difference? And so we are looking at our um, uh, storytelling ability, but with real evidence. And, um, and lastly, actually, um, again, you've probably heard it as we've been talking, uh, we, I want to do fewer things. And I want to keep it simple. Uh, so we talk about kissing a lot in our keeper, but you talk about keep it simple, stupid, because we just want people to really focus on one or two things, whether it's behavior or whether it's changing to the ecosystem, because the hardware and by mean process or the way that we do something needs to change. If we can focus on that and show that we are really moving the dial, then people trust us 
and then they get curious and then they want to make change happen. So it's continuing to build that. But the big thing for me is consistency. And again, let's use the analogy, it's like losing weight, isn't it? You can lose weight in a year, but if you don't keep practicing it, then you're just going to put it back on. So that's that's what's next for us. Love it. Consistency and persistence, they're our uh, kind of two mantras always with culture change. Exactly. And Shusha, to, to bring it to you for uh, a bit of a closeout, your biggest learning uh, in leading culture. I think actually it's my, it combines with being the chief executive as well. And I think, you know, I got to this, I, I managed to become chief executive based upon all the things I've done in the past. And I've got quite an analytical brain and I'm able to sort of analyze things and everything else. And so that's what's got me here. But I think I, they often say what's got you so this but it isn't the thing that's going to get you successful in the next time and i think where I, where i have changed and where i've thought really hard about it which falls very heavily in this culture category is the impact that i have and everything i do matters not because i'm important but because people look out for what i'm doing and they follow that as much as anything else and so i'm very very conscious about that and i'll just give you an example amanda in terms of what i'm talking about here I have a meeting and I look at my diary in the morning and I don't and I go through stuff and I make sure papers are advanced and I go through everything and these are my points and I'll be really trying to be efficient around what I want to convey in terms of the points I want to make. But then I spend time thinking about what is the impact I want to make? What is the impression I want to leave with the people in the room once they finish the meeting? And I think that's just a life hack, actually. You do, you, people don't spend very much time. They think about what's the thing that I need to, what's the point I need to get across. But actually, I, I found that, and that the example that Dom said, I wasn't leaving the room because I was disappointed in people. I was leaving the room because I wanted to sit. So I was very clear in terms of what I said before I left and then checked out what happened afterwards because the impact is what's important. And that is what people remember. They'll take the action points and they'll come and follow it up. But I think that's really important. It doesn't matter whether the chief executive or anything else. And it's critical for cultural change. Because they're looking at, and if you're consistent in that regard, then I think people think, yes, this is going to happen. It's sustainable. Brilliant. That is brilliant advice to leave on. And so, Shuja, Shuja, SJ, and Dom, thank you for taking the time. I know you three spend a lot of time talking culture between yourselves. So, thank you for allowing us all to join you in that conversation. Um, Akiva's been on a wonderful journey and you know, I'm very confident that that will continue on and we've enjoyed being a part of that journey with you. So thank you everybody who joined. I know there's one question we haven't answered. We will take that offline and we've run out of time. And uh, thank you everyone and have a good rest of day, evening, depending where you are in the world. Thank you.